right, Jeff, how you doing, my man? We're live. Well, the, you know, it looks like double trouble to me. So it looks like I'm at the right place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're welcome in the crew. Yeah. Hop on in. <laughs> We're looking for a champion. <laughs> so, well, I know yeah. this is this is like your, you guys' third call together, right? This is my mm-hmm. second time meeting Jeff. How did you two originally get connected? Through Nick Peterson. Yeah, yeah, so he was almost immediately, he was like, okay, so it's a no-brainer. You guys need to know. <laughs> That's Jeff. exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And, Anybody and who yeah. comes through, uh, you know, my Uncle Nick is uh, got instant <laughs> certification, you know. Is that okay. what we're supposed to call him? <laughs> we need well, to call it's, him you know, it's think... sort of a you know, reversal there, but uh, you get it. <laughs> <laughs> For this episode, we'll call him Uncle Nick. Okay. <laughs> Uncle Nick. <laughs> well, let's talk about you, though, Jeff. I mean, yeah. so thank you for the time that you have spent with us. B- very big appreciation. Uh, I, I got um, you. Thank yeah. you. So um, let's chat about you because you have a fascinating story, but obviously from your story has spun off all these interesting other adventures you've been on. So, um, but with you, I mean, you have, I don't even know where to start. I know, uh, Olympics were involved. There was definitely a, a bunch of work leading up to that. And then now you're working with some of the biggest athletes and, uh, you know, business minds out there. Uh, what were you when you, uh, like, who were you before all of these times and, mm-hmm. and what got you there? Well, when I was seven, I thought it'd be really cool to be an Olympian. And that was on the radar really early. Wow. And um, I, I didn't know the sport, but I just thought it would be really cool to march into the parade, into the stadium on the opening day ceremonies. So that became a, a very first target of mine. And I was pretty tenacious. And I saw a guy walk into uh, a bike shop that uh, I was working at as a kid. I was, I was actually the mascot, actually, <laughs> at the bike shop. And um, he had this T-shirt on that said USA Olympic team on it. And I I, when I saw that, I was like, I want that t-shirt. Mm. And the only way you could get it the old fashioned way, because there no, was no online at that time, I had to become an Olympian. So I said, well, uh, what's this look like? Well, I said, well, take me 10 years to get there at the very uh, soonest. So uh, let the journey begin. And that's uh, how it all started. And I think it's important to note that, um, you know, how we show up and what we do does have impact. And I am always mindful of the fact that whether it's a podcast or just a trip back to pick up the paper, somebody's always watching, somebody's always listening. So to always take the high road every moment to call people to the biggest game possible. Mm. So I was really lucky with that. And then uh, my dad uh, made an early exit from the family at 13 last time I saw him. And I had a couple of angels come into my life that Mm. uh, one was my uh, cycling mentor, who's a five-time national champion, three-time Olympian. And, you know, he's really interesting because uh, he taught me how to win. He said, the most important thing about this is to understand that being able to win and produce your best work is a learned skill. It's not an accident. It's not about trying harder. It's an applied skill. So let me show you how to do that. And we did that. And uh, then when I was 18, <clears throat> three years away from my uh, Olympic target, uh, with no guarantee, I might add eight, mm-hmm. seven years into it with no guarantee I'd make it. I uh, <clears throat> entered uh, uh, the University of Southern California where I studied sports science and eventually got my master's degree from there. But uh, that's when I met my second mentor, who was truly my um, like life soul mentor. And he was uh, a Victorian born in the late 1890s. And he was a true Renaissance man. And uh, mm-hmm. he uh, uh, developed a, a whole new type of art glass sculpture that uh, he chose me to be his apprentice. So it was a very unlikely pairing because I was 18. He was 76. Uh, mm-hmm. Olympian student now being art uh, master apprentice. It was a kind of an odd combo there. <clears throat> but what came out of that is that uh, uh, during our breaks and at lunch, he would play classical music. He would read the great philosophers to me. He would fill me up with uh, the um, uh, great uh, thinkers of, uh, of history. Hmm. And he said, I just need to fill you up on this stuff because it's an extra dimension that you have the capacity to absorb. And I want to make sure if I have anything to say about it, that you open up this side of you because it will be a really important part of your evolution. Mm-hmm. And uh, so at that time I was uh, assisting him in his glass uh, masterpieces. I was a student at USC. I had aspirations to be an Olympian, which was uh, you know, really a full-time job in all three of those areas that I did simultaneously. And then uh, when I was 21, I did become an Olympian. So that was, you know, nice. check the box on the, first, Got the shirt. highest aspiration. Got the shirt. Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> you know, actually a story about this is that yeah. after the Olympics, it disappeared. <laughs> it's like, where'd the shirt go? 
you know, and somebody Tom uh, Brady did. <laughs> some tell, yeah, they did. They Tom Brady did. It's like, it's possible. I, I would never let this out of my sight. Yeah. And so lo and behold, last year I kind of reacquainted with my high school girlfriend and uh, she said, well, I'm coming up to your area. I've got a high school reunion. I said, well, why don't we get together? And somehow we got on the shirt thing. And I said, I don't know what happened to the shirt. She said, I think I got the shirt. It's like, what? <laughs> Wow. This is 48 years later. Wow. And so, uh, you know, three seconds later after she looked, she said, is this it? You know, with a photo, I said, it's it. This is it. So we had this sort of miraculous uh, boomerang back into uh, existence, the t-shirt. So, wow. and then you got, got uh, your hands on it. Got my hands on it. Got it. Good uh, for you. you know, sealed vault at this moment as we speak. So good for you. That's that was cool. kind of the, the, the long story of it, but a couple other sidelights to this. So um, when I got my master's degree, uh, I had just uh, completed my uh, athletic career in formal competition. And <clears throat> at that time, then athletes came to me, they wanted to win gold medals and make a bunch of money as pros. And business came, people came to me and said, well, you know, I uh, have to be my own champion. You must know something about that. Can you help me become my own champion? And so I helped them both show up and do what had to get right to manifest their talents, to get the spoils of their aspirations. And that order is really important because it wasn't about uh, technical sides of the disciplines. That's what coaches are for. But you need somebody in your corner that is watching your back, seeing everything that's happening in real time, that's able to identify the problems you don't see that you can't avoid and the opportunities that you don't know about that you need to seize to be able to create your best legacy. And so that's ultimately the role that I ended up playing both in the business and in the sports world. And then the athlete said, how do I not get injured? Because if I can extend my career, that could be tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. And that was the same thing that the business people lack. You know, how do I not die from a heart attack that I see all my counterparts doing? So I decided to go back to chiropractic college, which I did. And I was able to then have a licensure to help them get and stay well and avoid uh, injuries. So with that kind of three pronged, yeah. oh, so you know how to perform at your best. Yeah, as an Olympian, you have to have, it has to be in your DNA. You have to have lived the experience if you're going to take someone to the rarefied stratosphere of personal performance. It's not like you can just read books about it and be it, it's not possible. Mm -hmm. And so I had that going, I had the academic side of it because of everything that I did at USC with the sports, uh, you know, medicine stuff. And, and then with the chiropractic licensure, there was nothing that I hadn't seen. So people in sports business and entertainment recognize that I was like 10 people in one mm -hmm. and I could craft their path forward, but I could also control the path knowing how much of what needed to be there because it wasn't just an assembly of experts all putting in their input, but nobody orchestrating, is it too much or too little? And so that's how I got to work with uh, Lance at all seven of his tour victories. I've been on Branson's Island, uh, uh, been with you two uh, on tour backstage, you know, working on nice. the crew, working on the team, uh, the band and stuff. So that's kind of the genesis and how it uh, got there because it's, it's all about performance, the specifics of it. Uh, you can get the guy to tune your guitar. I don't know anything about it, but I can help you get on stage and do 131 concerts in a world tour over the next 18 months and make sure that you survive it. So that's kind of how this whole thing uh, came to be. Wow. Yeah. That's a hell of a story because <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's just, it, just a, uh, it's amazing. No, it, it's, okay. it's powerful because of the multi-dimensional of you, you know, your experience and um, you know, that's, it's the crossover and that's what I've always thought with, and I think you're the only one that we've had on so far who've really, you know, worked a lot with high level athletes and business professionals mm -hmm. And there's so much crossover and there that's, is. that's what I've always wanted to kind of get the athletic side, the athlete's mindset and, yeah. and how we can apply that here. Because I think there's a lot to, to learn. And I know you yeah, have a whole blueprint sure. you know, built yeah, on sure. that back of your knowledge. <clears throat> so your own Olympic story, like were you, did you have a lot of this, uh, you know, obviously you didn't know the roadmap then or your kind of the process, but naturally as a kid, like at seven, you said, yeah. Were you already that driven and motivated to stay the course? I know there's ups and downs and there's all these interesting paths you go down on the journey. I, yeah, I did. I, I, I have the self-start gene hmm. and um, I, I'm curious, but I'm not reckless. And I, okay. I'm not a thrill seeker for the 
sake of, uh, you know, for the sake of novelty. Uh, when I get called to something, I show up for duty and I get the job done, whatever that is. So it's, it's a bit of a different way of doing it. Um, you know, rather than choose a target, I let the target choose me. Mm-hmm. And I know what it feels like to experience a calling. And I know how to answer that. And I'm fearless when I know that I'm called to do that. For example, we adopted our daughter 11 years ago from Columbia at the age of 10. Mm. I was 58 and people thought I was crazy just because of the risk factor to that. And I was also at the height of my career. And, uh, you know, but I, I kind of knew that I had to do it. And I feel that uh, I'm honor bound to honor the privilege of uh, the insight to do things that I'm called to do. And I found that it takes a lot less energy to do where it gets tough is when personal ambition gets in the way and we get disappointed. We think things aren't going fast enough. You know, that's pro aging, um, yeah. you know, accelerated, so to speak. So uh, that's kind of the driving force behind it. And uh, the kind of presence of being that I, I bring to it. Yeah. And it sounds like it, you just, cause this reminded me of probably one of the sessions that you and I had chatted about is yeah, it's you're letting the the target find you because Correct. it seems like you're more in the flow in that sense. Then you're not, there's not a lot of friction, you know, it's, it's, you're probably supported by other, you know, factors around you, people or systems. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe, yeah. Are there ways to, <clears throat> to help people identify those things? Cause I feel like as entrepreneurs, we are, I mean, Matt and I know <laughs> we are with the amount of people that talk to us on these podcasts. Uh, there's so many opportunities out there. And I feel like even now the world has changed a lot. Uh, I'd argue there's probably even more, you know, to choose from and, and different, of course, but how, you know, what are some filters maybe we can, we can chat about that help you find your, the right thing to actually sink in on? Well, you said the magic word, right. And uh, in the champions world, and I'll not to ex- say that that's a business sports entertainment life itself. Um, but the key thing that all the prolific achievers want, they want to make sure they have the right goal first. There's mm-hmm. plenty of goals out there. Yeah, there's big, hairy, audacious goals there's the smart goal, there's small goals, there's aspirational goals, there's all sorts of stuff, you know, that we're encouraged to pursue. Um, There's no shortage of uh, experts there telling us what we need to be doing. But, you know, to say that the key thing here is to make sure that you have the right goal. And the right goal is unique in that it aligns your mind, body, and your soul. And when those three aspects that make us up are in alignment, then it gives us an empowerment to get things done because it conveys a very special type of focus that I call GOCUS. Hmm. So when we know we have the right goal, our anxiety drops because it's gone through a filter. Mm -hmm. And I can explain the filter in a second here, but when it's gone through the filter, we have consciously seen that something has merit that we have tested against a certain level of criteria. And when we do that and we see in the affirmative that there's every reason to do this. It's not just a wild guess or an impulse or a fear of loss. You know, some of the traditional reasons why people do stuff or to make up for something that I don't feel like I have to validate myself. I'll go out and do this. You know, there's all sorts of reasons that uh, are perhaps not the best of motive that services the person the best, but to say uh, the right goal creates that alignment. It gives us goal focus or gocus trademark word, meaning that we're able to hyper-focus on the stuff in front of us, which is mandatory, to get stuff done to advance towards goal completion. And what's the mantra that we've all heard like only a million times, which is the hyper-focus, hmm. which I, I agree on. That's half of what you should be looking at it through. But then we have, from the point of hyper-focus, we have this whole peripheral vision here. And in this peripheral space here, this is actually where better ideas for the goal that you're pursuing actually show up. And it's also where blind sides are starting to form. You know what it's like. You have something that's happened and then you stop. Well, why did that happen? And you could see that you saw it happening earlier, but you didn't pay attention (laughs) and it played itself out. Now you got to deal with the consequences of it, right? right? So when you have the right goal and your anxiety drops and you have GOCUS, you're simultaneously getting stuff done while having a peripheral awareness of better options and how to avoid blind sides. So that would be by far one of the criteria to look at. And I'll add two more if I may here. Sure. I think that, you know, that identifies it as being the right goal. And I'll just say here that each of the letters in the word right stands for something that you challenge the goal that you're considering pursuing against. 
So the R in right is relevant. You know, how relevant is the goal for you? Like for me, why was it relevant to adopt our daughter? Well, to save a life. You know, does that have value or not? Yes or no. So automatically you can see that that's a, a criteria that kind of needs to be there to know that it's the right goal to spend my time, effort, and energy pursuing. Sure. The uh, I in right stands for indicators. Like what are the indicators that tell you that this is the right goal? Will you be making enough money? Will this do enough to promote your career? Uh, will this satisfy an intellectual need that you have to perform at a certain intellectual intellect level? Mm -hmm. uh, will this fit a physical requirement? Is it too much? Is it too little? Is there enough humanity in this for you to pursue it? So you can see when we kind of look at our proposed goal through the indicators that it changes our relationship to the goal, mm -hmm. we're actually in the courtship phase of developing a love affair with the goal rather than it just being a vehicle to something that we want, you know, it changes it completely. Right. And then, so the, the G stands for gravity. What's our emotional attachment to it? Can you name it? Can you describe it? And then the H and right is height. Is it the right altitude? Are the people involved in this at the same altitude that you're involved in that calls your soul into the game? Are the uh, values that you're bringing to this goal in alignment with yourself? And then the T and right is for time. Is this the right time to pursue the goal? Yes or no. Do you have the time to do it? Yes or no. Is the time to completion acceptable to you? Yes or no. So you can see that when we go through this and take the time, it truly changes the relationship between you and goal. It makes you want to fight for it more because you understand it. Hmm. You feel like you two are in the foxhole together fighting for something of value. Yeah. And that's the reason why, you know, to me, that right goal filter is, is essential. It's, it's uh, back to the, like the, um, the peripheral vision and having, you know, the, the gokus, you know, kind of that, yeah, that focus, but still uh, <laughs> yeah. we chatted with, yeah, it, we, we chatted with uh, Stephen Kotler recently. From oh, he's the, one of my all-time favorite people. He was a client for a while. I know yeah, Steve. He's he a was great such guy. a cool, yeah. such a cool guy to have he on is. here. And, um, yeah, and he great. mentioned the field of vision, and he said specifically, like one of the most proven ways to immediately lower anxiety and get to that parasympathetic state, you know, is to put your fingers out and try to see your fingers in your peripheral vision. Oh, what a great That's, exercise. It That's is. Great. And he's like, think of athletes and just being in the wild and, you know, like, yeah, you have a lion or something running at you, but you sure as hell are going to figure out like, okay, <laughs> how are you going to get out of here? And yeah. but you're focused on the thing. So it's, yeah. it's interesting you mentioned that. Uh, it's I, yeah. perfect. Time. I, think, I think another side of this too, is that what it does, it also calls out some of the mythology of goal achievement because, mm. you know, what's the mantra? Hyper-focus, want it bad enough, stay in the game. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Go, but go, I, go, go. I, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, not sure about that, you know, because, you know, if you look at a hyper focus, man, you know, you, you notice a mountain lion once he's got his you know, teeth around your neck, you know, or if you had yeah, yeah. peripheral vision, you would have seen it. So I think that there's a lot of mythology in the goal achievement uh, space that keeps us confused hmm. and it uh, sets people up for um, a self assessment about their inability to be able to achieve goals because of some of the mythology out there. So certainly that idea of hyper-focus, that's 50% of the focus, but there's another 50% as well. Yeah. Well, let's, let, let's break down the, the goal achievement roadmap. I know last time that we had a call together, um, that's what you did with us. Um, I think we probably chatted over the course of maybe an hour and a half last time we talked. Um, but <laughs> probably not going to be possible fully here. <laughs> but um, maybe we can we can try to do like the Cliff's Notes version of the the uh, goal achievement right. roadmap. Cool. Absolutely right. So, you know, the observation was when I was contemplating what is the process by which I've helped people in all disciplines perform at the highest level possible, and I realized, well, the champion's golden rule is you do the homework and the test is easy. So there's two basic parts to this. And here's a graphic uh, uh, actually right there, the roadmap. We actually have it up on our second monitor over oh, here. So we're looking at it with you. <laughs> so if we look at it, this kind of egg shape on one, the first half is about preparation. So you prepare. And then the second half is about perform. First you prepare, then you perform. So is that the 50-50 split just to uh, stop you right there? Because you said like it seems like the performance is probably the people that are the go, 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 you know, to the, but they're not fully prepared for that goal. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, most people as 
you know, 99% perform, you know, 1% prepare. Right. Exactly. And, and, you know, again, if you look at, well, why, why would we do that? Well, number one, we're told to make it up as we go. I, I don't know anybody that plays big that does that. Mm -hmm. You know, they want to make sure because it's like, if you're not prepared, your anxiety is up because you know, you're not prepared. Mm -hmm. Anxiety is up. You're not making really good decisions. So I would say, you know, most people aren't adequately prepared and they're not because there are five steps that history has revealed are important for us to uh, confirm that we're prepared. We need some objective um, truth serum against our presumption. Mm -hmm. And so the five steps in preparation are number one is clarity. Make sure that you have the right goal because when you have the right goal, then it gives you goal focus, the ability to hyper-focus, get stuff done, see blind sides and better options occur. Step number two in preparation is motive. Like, well, why am I doing this? And the reason why understanding the reasons why is that when we understand the reasons why, then it gives us drive. It gives us kind of an emotional energy to stay in the game to actually achieve the goal. For example, a friend of mine uh, lost his job in the 2008 financial crisis. Mm -hmm. He needed to take care of his family. That was his motivation in a way to which they were accustomed. So he said, okay, I, I build hot rods as a hobby. So I'm gonna build a car that's so exotic, Jay Leno's gonna hear about it mm -hmm. and he's gonna buy it for half a million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> and so 7,500 hours, 2.5 years later, the tank car was ready, he took a got car engine out of a tank, built the tank car around it. Jay heard about it, bought it for half a million bucks. And now he builds a car every couple of years. He's having a great uh, time in life. So wow. really understanding why we're doing what we're doing from an objective standpoint gives us drive. And any goal of any significance does require drive, but we need to know we have it to be confident and show up and get the job done. Mm -hmm. Step number three is impact. What's the impact of my goal on myself, on my legacy, on others, and the world around me? Why that's important is that when we see the ripple effect and the potential to help others play a much bigger game, to create a bigger legacy and have a better life quality, then that gives us purpose. It gives us a steadfastness to show up and pursue and achieve the goal because we know it's just not for us, but it's going to help others as well. Step number four is mindset. And when we talk about mindset, and notice that all this is before we actually start pursuing the goal. This is all right. in the preparation. When we talk about mindset, we're not talking about willfully mowing down anything in the path. We're not talking about gratitude journals. We're not talking about affirmations and we're not talking about positive thinking in this instance the mindset we're talking about is do we understand that our human nature has two mentalities part of us reacts to life at high speed almost faster than we can think mm -hmm. which is a survival response to a set of circumstances we also have a side of us that i call the champion's mind the other one's the human mindset because it's fixed in biologic. We can't shut it off. And the champion's mind is a conscious side of us that carefully selects historically proven actions that will advance us towards goal completion. And by following those, that allows us to create a life of excellence. Mm. And so our human mindset and our champion's mind have different messages to ourselves. So for example, given an opportunity, your human mindset may say, what do you stand to lose here? So you get very defensive, you start to crawl in the cave, you get cold, you don't wanna share. Mm -hmm. You can't create greatness from that. The champion's mind would say, given an opportunity, what do I stand to gain? It's optimistic, there's plenty of room to share with everybody. Let me support you to get to your bigger, um, I, I'm warm. I, I, yep. Again, I'm prosperous. I've got oxygen in the lungs. I really want to do this. And why having the champion's mind is important is because many times it's contrarian to contemporary thought. So we have to take action despite our kind of apprehensions. And we call that courage. 
Mm -hmm. Having the champion's mind gives you the courage to do what has to go right when it has to go right. Then we have step number five in preparation, which is resources. Do we have the time and the energy? Do we have the skills and knowledge? Do we have team? Do we have materials and um, other resources? Do we have a map? And so once we have enough of, let's say, the fixed goods in the inventory, then what we can do, if we vetted the previous four steps, we can trust our preparation. Mm -hmm. There's nothing left to do other than now push the green go button. <laughs> and so, so once we're ready, we push the green go get button. We have five steps <clears throat> in um, the performance side, the second half of the roadmap. So step number six, the first step in division two performance is um, uh, what I call, what is it? Is, uh, um, <laughs> it's the green button. It's the start. Yeah. It's, it's start. Just, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I just blanked that. Mm, start. That's okay. Yeah. And, and the reason why start is important is that most people think, well, I prepared enough here. Yeah. And now I just need to perform. I know what to do. Not true. Yeah. Because if you're prepared, but you don't have a deliberate start sequence, you can trip out of the gate. And if you trip out of the gate and bungle it, then all of a sudden you're off to the wrong race because you're already in last place. Mm -hmm. You're never going to get there. So having a very deliberate starting procedure that allows you to have an early victory that I call liftoff that you can point to and say to team and everybody else, our preparation was adequate and appropriate because now we've met this liftoff criteria, mm -hmm. which is great. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then so step number seven is what I call the honeymoon. And the honeymoon is uh, that point after we've scored our liftoff success where everybody's still all excited and everything, but all of a sudden, what do we know about honeymoons? They all wear off, right? <laughs> they yeah, eventually yeah. go away. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. So, so now we're in the, you know, now we're in the, you know, the mope zone. It won't, won't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we should anticipate that happening because it's actually demonstrating that we're actually making progress. Yeah. Real quick question. Most, yeah. With the, with the liftoff, what, what would be like an example of a liftoff maybe for an athlete and for a business? Yeah, sure. So for me, an athlete, an Olympian, you know, I was a kid that wanted to become an Olympian. So my lift off that told me it was real and told everybody else it was, if I want to race in my city, it's mm -hmm. like, he's really serious. You know, this is demonstrated. Gotcha. Well, let's okay. say you got the space shuttle. Well, the space shuttle is throttling up on the pad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that it's 50 feet off the pad, this is real. Yep. And so let's say for a launch, right? You push the green button on launch and everything. And then all of a sudden the Geiger counter starts and you see, you know, okay, we're at 100, now we're at 200, now we're at 300. Yeah, this is for real. So, you know, pop the champagne bottle. Yeah, so, and then honeymoon stage is probably what happening, probably right there. Like, this is so exciting. That's this what is I mean. Cool. Let's go out and spend money on everything. We're right <laughs> yeah, yeah. there. What sort of a Bentley color are you? What are you getting? <laughs> exactly. After a product launch. <laughs> right. I mean, that's another thing. Like, I'll take it to entrepreneurs. Right. I, I know we've known collectively, probably all of us, you too, Jeff, is like, yeah, someone does a product launch and then, you know, you have this big spike in cash, but right. then what <laughs> yeah. do you do? Like right. typically they're not going to withstand it because they're honeymoon and probably buying the Bentleys yeah. or, right. exactly and they're not right. supporting it with the, what's well, in the marketing the world, we have what, uh, what we call marketer math, where somebody might make a hundred thousand dollars off a launch in one month and they'll go, look, I have a $1.2 million yeah, business. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, that, that does sort of speak to it because in our own mind, that means the goal is easy. We just need to ride it out and we'll get there. Yeah, exactly. And so what happens when the uh, honeymoon wears off, now what? Well, that's where you got to have a reality check. And so mm -hmm. this is where you kind of recalibrate everything to make sure that, you know, we pulled the first layer of friction out of it. So things are moving right along. And then uh, step number eight here is um, the daily grind. And this is that point in any aspirational goal where you're just, God, I'm not getting anything back close to the time and effort that I'm putting into this. I mean, this is like freaking ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I'm like one second away from quitting, you know, while I at least still got something left. It's like a burnout phase for a lot of folks. It sounds it, like. It, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. It, they're just not progressing like they think that they should. This is like where athletes plateau and things like that. Yes. Uh, yes. And, and this is where, you know, actually most business people are actually stuck here. Actually they're on a terminal <laughs> Um, you know, the hamster wheel of daily grind because they just can't get out of it. They don't know how to get from daily grind to complete the cycle of action to actually complete the goal itself. But you know that because you're in the, the misery index is off the chart. You're in the red zone. Mm -hmm. You know, you just don't want to get up. You don't want to face anybody. The idea of showing up is just like repulsive. Mm -hmm. um, 
But I would even argue to... in the business world, that's a lack of the very first thing, which is the goal. I don't think the goal is clear enough if you if you get to that point and then you're just spinning your wheels forever. It's almost like maybe you you don't have that clearly defined enough. Well, you, you know, there's all sorts of chances to screw it up. You know, mm. we could screw it up step one in preparation because we don't have the right goal. So when we start, we're automatically 15 degrees off, yep. you know? And so what's that going to be, you know, in a couple of months, it'll be 30% off, you know? So if we don't screw it up there, we could screw it up by misinterpreting mindset, you know, right. just we mow over everything or no, we don't have enough resources. Let's just trust the universe to give us what we need, even though there's no evidence of that. Let's just start. What do you say? We don't need a starting procedure. So there's all sorts of ways that you can absolutely screw yourself up. But mm -hmm. in the model, we kind of use it as a truth serum against our presumption to make sure that we're held in reality against a criteria that reaffirms where we are so we can't wiggle out of it. Mm -hmm. that, that's the value of this. That makes so sense. Yeah. if we get through the daily grind and there are some very specific procedures and processes that um, are in the curriculum and the course that I've mm -hmm. put together that helps uh, people identify what that is and where they are and how it can be personalized for their needs, then eventually you get to a place where you actually believe that you can do it. If you stay in the game long enough for the right reasons and don't quit in the, in the daily grind, you'll get up one day, you can believe it. It's like, hey, he's no smarter than I am. If he can do it, I can uh -huh. do it. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. that's a really important milestone. It's, it's pretty wild, yeah, when you can achieve that point and, oh, yeah. and you realize you finally, it's, it's more like an understanding like, oh, this is the race that I've wanted to be in or I thought I was trying to get to, but exactly. oh man, I'm here and I'm owning this like I meant to be here for it. Yeah, and, and the fact and the truth is you are because you premeditated everything in advance, not like a straight jacket, but you set <laughs> the tone of the path to then be able to make the micro adjustments en route that carry your momentum forward predictably. And I love that because I think everybody should get the results of their efforts and their intelligence in, in doing this. Yeah. Um, so then the next step after the daily grind, step number nine is uh, breakout. And this is where we go from believing that we can do it to knowing we can do it. And this is by uh, identifying another target that would be the equivalent of the goal, but not the goal itself that tells us and team that we can actually do this. So for example, for myself in athletics, at the national championship, I knew that if I beat uh, an existing Olympian or the national champion, I could become an Olympian. It didn't make me an Olympian, but it told me that I could. Mm. And that's how I developed the knowing that I could do this because I did beat the national champion and I was able to do that. When I was working with Dave Asprey, you know, as the voice inside Dave's head at uh, Bulletproof, um, mm -hmm. you know, I said, Dave, you know, uh, this is gonna work you know, but we got to go from believing it can work to knowing it can work. What do we need to do to make that happen? Well, we need inventory to meet the demand. And we also need uh, the right qualified people and leadership to be able to deal with this velocity that we're now finding ourselves in. What's that going to take a couple million bucks or whatever. So the money was raised. And once the money was raised, then we went from believing we could do it to knowing we could do it. And then Dave just needed to uh, keep things moving forward as planned in step number 10, which is finish the job by not screwing it up, not trying to race too fast to get to the finish line, not being too careful and going too slow. Both of them carry equal hazard. Dave was aware of that, was fastidious to the pacing of it, and now Bulletproof has become what it is. Wow. So those are the cliff notes of the 10 steps of the Goal Achievement Roadmap. There you have it. That was fast, right. actually. Was uh, can we share this the, this image on the actual page where people are listening oh, yeah. to the episodes? Yeah, so they of can course. Sort of, okay, cool. So we'll share it so you can sort of visually follow along over yeah, on yeah, our show yeah. notes page. Cool. Yeah, and for, also, for sure. before we get too far, um, how do people get to the course? Because I know you do have a deeper dive. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, sure. People want to do that. Uh, yeah. Shout out the URL if you can. Yeah, for sure. I, you know, actually, there's a, a video that I'd love them to go look at that uh, you know mm -hmm. gives them a nice uh, introduction to it. It's very generous, actually. Yeah. That's uh, www.beforeyouwin.com. Before you win. Okay. Just pop that in there. That'll uh, take you to uh, a place to get a PDF, uh, which is called How Not to Blow It Just Before You Win. Mm -hmm. That's something everybody should look at and study carefully. And mm -hmm. um, the reason why I'm providing that is they have something to look at while they're waiting for the uh, information to be sent to them to be able to go to the link to be able to gain access to the video Thanks. And the course itself. Yep. Cool. When, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Before you win. Thank you. Before you win. Yeah. So going back to the goal achievement roadmap with, with the finish line, what, what does a finish line look like in business? Like the bulletproof example, like 
you know, in my mind, when you have a business, like, is there really a finish line? You're just trying to, to grow the business. How do you define what a finish line looks like within a business, like something like Bulletproof? Well, you have to decide that yourself. I mean, that's uh, something that people would decide, you know, like, let's say $100 million. Okay, maybe it's 10 million. Maybe it's just to bake a cake, get the cake out of the oven with the icing on it to present it, you know, at the birthday party. You know, you decide what that is that completes a cycle of action. So the roadmap is actually macro and micro because the plans within the pl- or the goals within the goals to get to the overall goal, you can use this for that as well. So it's a way of kind of making sure that you're keeping track of everything like simultaneously. So mm. again, that's the yeah. advantage of this because then see, then what you're doing, you're creating a common vernacular that people can use to discuss the goal achievement process and goal achievement is not goal setting. Somehow people think, well, if I set the right goal, they don't even ask that. If I set the goal of my vision, you know, then somehow it's going to magically manifest itself. And so, you know, we have to remain steadfast in the off ramps that are uh, epidemic uh, and always a a risk in the goal uh, pursuit process. We got to have something that keeps us honest. Yeah. And that's, that is, it's too easy to just say you're going to go do something, but Absolutely. this is an achievement roadmap. So the whole thing is, do you actually want yeah, to man. achieve this thing? Well, and it's yeah. circular too. So it's like, once you hit that finish line, you, you set a new goal and you, that's correct. you start over. So right. like maybe with a correct. business, you might be shooting for a uh, million dollars to begin with. You hit that goal. Okay. The right. process starts over. The new goal is 10 right. million. Mm. That's great. That's great. Because circumstances have changed mm. and we have to make sure that our path forward is consistent with the reality of the current context. Yeah, for sure. But the biggest thing is, you know, where people get derailed is that they think they can keep everything in their head or, or they can uh, steer things through spreadsheet. Mm-hmm. It, the spreadsheet is the outcome of the adherence to the right path. The path helps create the spreadsheet. It's uh, not the other way around. It, another yeah. thing too is that it's always a good idea to have a map before you go into the jungle. <laughs> there's like danger there you know yeah. don't look for the map once you're in the jungle and you're lost right so it's true i well, mean and it's very easy to get into that jungle you know nowadays is, with man. technology and all that you can go down a yeah. really <laughs> it's very yeah. deep well i mean kind of on the same vein i was gonna say I, I think another big problem is that that goal that you're shooting for a lot of times is a moving target you know sure. if, if you don't well, kind it, of it set should it be and, it, it yeah. should be it, it should be i have a process called stair stepping where actually one of the things that the prolific achievers do is that, yeah, they have an overarching goal, but the true next target is the point of visibility that's Mm -hmm. on the horizon that current context tells them that's the next target that they can actually pursue because they have enough information to know that that's it. You may not know what to do after that. And so you decide that once you get there. And if a better option shows up, the champions, they never rigidly stick to what they said they were going to do if a better option shows up. So they how would you, sh- how would you, uh, hmm. yeah, no, this is a really good point. So you don't, you're not always going to complete the circle, I guess, you know, if a better option comes up. That well, you, shows- can, you can adjust it in process, actually, because okay. if you look at step number nine, it's breakout. Breakout. Oh. That, that's a target. That, that, that you're naming then uh, okay. and you could actually name it earlier too, if it shows up. So that's kind of already built into this. And so it's, it's like a journey, basically. You're always yes. on this path. So you're just really Correct. defining where are you right now in this specific journey. That's the single journey. most important question. I, I, have a uh, process, mm-hmm. I have a process that I do with individuals. It's called the uh, a Champions Roadmap. It's a two call process to very in-depth conversations that are about kind of one thing identifying exactly where are you? And that's the question that everybody needs to ask first. Where am I? What's behind that I should have done that I haven't that could hurt me later, but it hasn't hurt me yet. What's in front of me uh, that I should know about so I don't step off the cliff? How do I avoid the preventable problem? And what do I do to capitalize on the best opportunities? And what's the smoothest path forward? So I actually have a two call process that's dedicated to that to show for the individual exactly what that looks like for them as an individual or for them in their business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Most important no, that, part ever. Most people are lost. They have right. no idea where they are. No idea. Yeah. And that's, it's what awareness is always the, the first key, you know? So you, you first be aware of where the heck are you? What kind of game are you playing right now? Yeah. And what's yeah. the prescription when you're lost? 
Right. Try harder. <laughs> it's like, what, try harder to get lost? It is. Okay. <laughs> it I is. Will. I'll just sleep less. Yeah. I'll just, I'll just Great idea. Worse, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm kind of curious about some stories here. I love the examples because, you know, the framework, once people see it, you know, and, and uh, yeah, you can get it and we'll, we'll make it all available. Yeah, on the show cool. Thanks for doing that. For sure. Thank you. I mean, uh, I want to hear some stories, uh, maybe from yourself, but also the folks, I know you told us one of the, uh, I think it was a long jumper, right? And, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. The yeah. English team uh, uh, in the Olympics. Yeah. And he experienced, you know, this is what, best in, best in the world. Best in the world. Yeah, it's leading the world championship, that. actually. So it went something like this, is that a couple of weeks before the Olympic final, um, I was called by the uh, United Kingdom uh, Olympic uh, team. If I could uh, help one of their athletes who was leading the world championship, by the way, mm-hmm. best in the world the time and he was starting to mentally unravel two weeks before the Olympic final. Could I help? So, I mean, obviously I knew something was wrong. He had the best coaches, best equipment, best yeah. every, everything, but he was starting to mentally melt down. So something was missing. So I, I talked with him uh, in a Skype. He was in London. I was here in California and we did the yickety yak and mm-hmm. I said, well, you know, this is not that difficult. Uh, in one instance, it's going to be the most difficult thing ever in another, but you know, you're mentally disconnected from your physical readiness. And we just need to reconnect your brain back with your body and you win the gold medal. And so we conversed about a lot of things. And I said, here's the primary problem is that you and your team are laboring under uh, one of the biggest myths in all of human creation that is never delivered that you think you need to do to win the gold medal. You need, you think that you need to put in the perfect jump to win. And so what's happening is that, you think the way that you're going to be prepared to put in the perfect jump is to have a contingency for every detail. So you guys are identifying every detail and having a contingency for it. But your mind is going to make up a detail that you're going to think you need to find that doesn't exist. And you're going to put all your confidence in that one thing that you can't find. Therefore, you've already lost. Hmm. So why don't we get rid of that myth for at least two weeks? And why don't we do what the champions do? They do the one or two things that have to go right. So in your case, two things and you win. Don't change your warm up. You've already done that. Your body's confused. It doesn't want to play. That's why it's in the cave. Go back to your, just your normal warm up. And then the first four steps to your run up will determine where your hit, foot hits the board to get the lift to win the gold medal. Two things and you win. And one other thing, who makes you happy? Well, I got two guys on the team. Those are your friends for the next two weeks. Forget about all the experts that are hyper obsessing about all the details that don't matter. You got to be happy. Two things, you win. Boom, presto, gold medal. And, and because of that, he also went on to win the World Championship, the European Championship, and the Commonwealth Games Championship. He won everything <laughs> because wow. he listened to his champion's mind. Do the two things that count when it counts. Don't worry about the perfection side of it. So wow. you know, great, great victory for him. Yeah, what was his name? What is his name? Uh, Greg Rutherford. Rutherford. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Because I remember looking him up and I'm like, how cool yeah. is that? I kind of want to go watch the YouTube video yeah. of that I think, now. I think I've seen the, the YouTube clip of it. I think he like in one of the events, he broke the record and then went on the same day to break his own record in the same day. <laughs> you, cool. know, the, the, you know, the craziest stuff happens when you kind of give up and you don't try so hard. You know, it's sort of a paradox, right? It is. So, yeah. you know, again, that was, a, that was an amazing story. Another story I'll tell you, I think that has a lot of merit. I'll tell you two stories, actually. Um, so uh, it, one of the Tour de France's I did with Lance, uh, uh, Tour number four, uh, was that right? Yeah, Tour number four or five. Uh, he, he was, ha- he was uh, 10% off. You know, he just wasn't performing well. What, mentally or physically? or Physic- physical. physically, physically. Physically, okay. yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. physically. But, you know, if the body doesn't work, then the mind goes in the toilet too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, you know, the strategy was, well, how do you get this back? when there are tens of millions of dollars at stake here for the sponsors and everything and mm-hmm. your teammates that have spent their whole career to support you. And now um, they're, uh, you know, you don't, you're not performing. What do you do with this? He said, the hardest thing I ever had to do was to face my teammates at breakfast, you know, because it was elusive to me. And so we talked about the strategy and what do you think the strategy was? Hmm. Don't do anything. Okay. Uh, you, 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 yeah. you wait for it to come to you. You don't start chasing it. No magic potions, uh, no uh, calls to mystics. Forget that. You know, we let it come to us. We practice the essentials. We be on the lookout to make sure that we're conserving energy. That's the way you do it. It's kind of putting faith into all that that stuff you did in the preparation phase. You know, yeah, having it, faith that all that stuff is 
going to pay yeah. off in the end. Yeah. Well, it's, and again, it's, it's faith in something tangible that's been vetted. It's not mm-hmm. uh, open faith against nothing. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. an open faith against what you've already proven to be true is what it is. And that, that's mm-hmm. why preparation is so important uh-huh. because if you haven't experienced and you haven't vetted, you, you're not going to believe it. And that's why people that don't do the right vetting as much as they say it doesn't bug them, it does bug them. You can't tell me it doesn't, you know, in, in 1% off can be the 1% difference between success and failure. Yeah. You know, that's why we need uh, people in our lives that can help guide us to learn the skill through its application. Well, there's something that's reminded me of, uh, I started going through, uh, uncle Nick's course, <laughs> one of them, uh, for bumpers after we had him on the show here. Yeah. That's and cool. yeah. And I Love highly that. recommend it to everybody on yeah, here. Too. And I know, I know you guys are book, working man. Yeah, it Fantastic is. book. And there was something, um, he, I think it was his very first video and he talked about how when, you know, stacking systems or stacking things or your focus on things, you mentioned a couple of examples ago, you know, focus on the one or two things yeah. and then, and be happy, <laughs> you know, like cut out all the rest. And he made, he was talking about how like, you know, if you start stacking things, your percentage of completion or achievement or whatever goes down, the more it you does. stack it does. and right. systems like technology and all that stuff they're typically the most reliable. They're about 90 something percent, 90, you know, up to 99, maybe nothing's perfect, but then the human behavior is like, that's the six, X factor, man. 60% or something. <laughs> that's the X factor, man. Yeah. Uh, that's, and, that's the X factor. And that's the interesting thing. I was like, okay, you start, you stack one or two things. Cool. Your percent and your behavior, you're probably likelihood following a goal achievement roadmap and all this stuff. Pretty good. But then you start focusing on everything. But see, that, that's, that's a yeah. human mindset thing. So if you're, yeah. Your human mindset will tell you in times of crisis, like it did Greg, you got to be perfect. There's no evidence for that. Mm -hmm. There's every evidence against it, but you can't believe it. You're believing your fear-based human instincts. You're trusting your human nature. You don't want to be human. You want to be superhuman. You don't want to be natural. You want to be supernatural, which means that you have to make choices that your average person wouldn't make because the choices that most people make are are reflexive. Mm-hmm. There are things that are common to the human's fear-based survival impulses. That's why we need something outside of that self to show us what to do when to achieve our goals consistently, predictably, and repeatedly. And that's what my practice is all about. That's what my table of champions small group coaching is all about. That is what my champions uh, roadmap to call process is all about. That's my DNA. Yeah. It's calibrated towards that. Seems like this is why also Nike probably has their slogan is just do it. It's like, just trust, you know, like <laughs> as long as it's the wrong thing, the right thing yeah, is the right vetted. thing. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if it's I'm the first thinking. impulse, I'm not sure. You know, yeah, just, we've all, yeah. we've all said that thing that sounded so right when I was going to say it. Yeah. And once I said it, whoops. <laughs> didn't vet I, t- that I one. take that yeah. back. I really didn't mean it really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's an interesting thing. Like yeah, the mindset, I think, is a lot of that preparation that people Huge. just stumble over. I mean, it's, and I know you focus a tremendous amount. You have a whole I breakdown do. of comparison of the human and the champion mindset. And mind, mindsets. And yeah, it's things yeah. like what you just said, less, focus on less, trust yourself, basically get out of your own way, you know? And <laughs> it is like, if I want it bad enough, it's going to happen. I mean, that does sound right, doesn't it? Uh-huh. But it doesn't work. <laughs> you yeah. can run it as bad as you want, but if you don't have the skill to execute it or create it, it isn't going to happen. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we have this just this prolific uh, library of myths that sound so right that deliver so wrong. And that <laughs> comes from our human mindset. It comes from our human nature. Yeah. It feels right. Well, because it feels right doesn't mean it is. So we, we need some reference point to refer to with some assurance that we can with certainty do certain things to get to where we want to go. Hmm. So that's yeah, the, like my that. whole existence is to help people with that. Yeah. That's so cool. Now, this is more just sort of feeding my own curiosity. There's probably not oh, going to yeah. be uh, <laughs> a, a lot of takeaways, but I'm kind of curious, how did you um, get connected with people like Tiger Woods and Lance Armstrong? Like how did, how did people like that come into your life? You know, it's all kind of incestuous in that um, the, the top knows the top, you mm-hmm. know, the, uh, musicians know the athletes, the athletes know the business people. 
et cetera, in, in their a very exclusive group that is very cautious. Hmm. You know, they don't, you know, you know, if you think a good coach is expensive, try an amateur. Mm-hmm. And it's like, because of the, uh, the public nature of their personas and things, and because of their needs are extraordinary, you know, people think that they've got life made. Well, you know, most of them have like 10 lawyers that are fighting lawsuits where people are suing them just to try to get money. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's terrible. I mean, the the complexity of it is like a thousand fold that most people have to deal with. And so um, they're cautious because they need to know that somebody understands their experience in that rarefied air. Uh, Mm -hmm. They need to know somebody is reliable and trustworthy with information and that can deliver uh, an extraordinary outcome for them to have this insurance that they'll be able to perform at their best. So mine was athletes, athletics into business, business into music, where hmm. it's within all of the different disciplines at this time. That's uh, how it uh, kind of spread. Yeah, cool. That's that's fascinating. Now, what I guess um, I have a couple, Where where's like a... Um... If someone were to, I'm just trying to think of like when someone's getting started is where, where's the biggest hang up when really, you know, with the whole goal, um, achievement roadmap, sure. yeah, you know, when someone's jumping in here and they're feeling motivated, where do you see the drop off normally happen? Is it like right yeah. in the get go or? Well, the drop off is that uh, human nature wants the shortcut as quickly sure. as possible. And to the extent of which you shortcut, you expose yourself to unnecessary risk and you know, premature stall for sure. That's like a Uh given. And in my deal is, is that uh, it's best to learn, like my cycling coach told me, I'm going to teach you how to win. And if you become an Olympian, that's great. But our target is going to be, you need to understand the process of winning Mm -hmm. and how you exactly do that. And then it can scale, but you have to learn it appropriately at a small scale. So you understand the process that allows you to then progressively go bigger and it's exactly the same thing. To me, goal achievement is life's primal skill because you can have the biggest dreams possible, but if you can't execute to manifest, then they stay stuck in our head. They're of not much value to uh, humanity because nothing's manifest and they're not much value to us because they're stuck inside of our head. And without a mechanism to extract them and predictably produce them, you know, with an act of, of love and care and attention and respect, then it becomes impossible to build into your talent. Yeah. One of the myths is well and talent are enough. No, they're not. They never have been. My dad was a, a genius and he died homeless on the streets of New York City. He had plenty of will, had plenty of talent, but he didn't have a model that showed him what to do to, to keep him in the game. Mm. So he misinterpreted the experience and concluded certain things that weren't real that you know, took him out of the game. So we have to learn the skill first and then we build to higher and higher levels of aspiration. That would be the one thing that I would say. And, yeah. and I would also say, you know, people think, well, if I do that, then I'm going to get left behind. No, you're not. Because the people right now that aren't doing that, they're going to trip mm-hmm. and they may talk themselves into early retirement because their belief in their ability to perform because of the consistent inability to get past a certain point talks them into the belief that it's just them when it's not. It's that they don't have a model to follow that showed them how to do it, to how to get through the anticipated sticky points that every uh, goal of any significance always has. That's my yeah. most important thing to say. I'm gonna, and it's getting me thinking because yeah, everybody wants the, the quick, quick route. And I feel yeah. like it's only getting faster and faster from your experience. I mean, you've been working with athletes for a very long time and you were one, you know, even before then, has it just gotten quicker, like even from the athletes, like just wanting to kind of rush the process or get to that end point quicker? Or is that, um, are those just people that aren't trusting, you know, following a process like this? Because I feel like without yeah. a process, you're just kind of going to keep going quicker and almost more anxiety levels, more burnout. Yeah, well, they do. I, I mean, you have in business as well, you have you know, kids have got to decide what their graduate school is going to be, you know, by the uh, end of their second year of life, you know, mm-hmm. what are you going to be kid? You know, 
Yeah. Well, they're still in underpants, you know. And <laughs> so I, I think the expectation and the mythology of pacing and evolution of individual to develop the competency to perform at their highest level is not being embraced in a sensible way. Because right. if the person doesn't have natural motivation and they don't have the ability to know what to do, then the outcome can't be achieved which then sets everybody up for disappointment that actually it's almost like a positive centrifuge that the worse it gets, the faster it gets worse. Mm -hmm. And just again, the professor, the, the, um, the pressure to perform, I, I think is a, a catastrophe because it takes a while to learn the skill, but once you've learned it, you can stay at the game at the highest level. Uh, I'm not going to say indefinitely, but yeah. you can stay in the game as long as possible to produce your best work. But if an athlete's injured too early because they're pushed too hard by the parents or the coach too early, um, and they think that they're actually getting an advantage by doing that, it, that's not, that's mythology. Hmm. You're setting them up to, to fail mentally. Uh, they can only be pushed uh, so far, so hard early to maintain a natural motivation. So I think the whole idea of pacing of this and you know, what are we solving for here? Are we solving for an individual to produce the highest volume of their best work, to have the greatest longevity, to produce the most memorable legacy and quality of life possible? Well, if that's what we're solving for, I can help you with that. Mm -hmm. You know, if your goal is to get to the finish line fastest, well, I may not want to do that because I know that there may not be a second or a third act and you may blow yourself up or burn yourself out prematurely yeah and that's something i i'm not interested in personally yeah i love hearing that because i know i'm I, like personally because i am the quick start i want to go but at the same time my mission is to at least my personal endeavor right now is slow everything down mm -hmm. i want to slow myself down and ideally it's going to slow time down so i feel like things just don't get away from me personally but i you know like i could just see the impact of going so fast and trying to rush things and not fully thinking out the preparation process. Like that's just, it's, 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 just it's, hard, like, it's hard to do because you know, I mean, you hear is. people talking about their gross incomes and somehow we think that that's what they're putting in the bank, you know, hmm. <laughs> I mean, you get around the competition and it's very common for people to say, well, everybody else's life is great. Mine's not, I just got to work harder, you know, or I should be farther along than I am. You know, these are all kind of things that we expect the human mindset to tell us that, that need to be reviewed and held in the context of the champion's mind to see that it's a great story that we're telling ourselves. But if we look at the uh, track record of it, it's like beyond dismal. Mm, so yeah. again, I feel like these levels of conversations, I mean, you could sell anything to anybody, just promise them a shortcut. Yeah. yeah whatever. <laughs> I'll pay you 10,000 for a shortcut, uh, you know, and then if it doesn't work, well, it's something I didn't do, you know, it's, it was my fault, you know, mm -hmm. cause everybody thinks that, you know, the things that happen in my life that are wrong, everything's my fault, you know, which, which is complete mythology, total mythology. Mm -hmm. So I think we have the reading of this game to a large extent uh, is really off and it doesn't serve the individual well if their intention is to create and have the best quality of life possible and leave room for change and, and growth and ultimately mature without blowing themselves up mentally or physically or relationship wise yeah. at the halfway point before they go into the locker room and forfeit a couple of decades of time and effort and a nasty divorce mm. or a catastrophic illness that could have been avoided. I mean, I see this stuff like all the time yeah. and it, it doesn't have to happen. Hmm. Wake up call for a lot of folks, hopefully, you know, and, and, uh, and just awareness again of what's possible. And you're hearing it from it from Mr. Jeff yeah. here, Dr. Jeff has seen it from the best from, yeah. from both sides of things. So it's been um, a joy. Got to tell yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Anything else to wrap it up here? You know, I, I, I we covered a lot of ground and, and I'm, I'm a little worried. Um, I, I feel like I could probably open up rabbit holes that would keep us going another hour or so <laughs> maybe around two let's in the do future. it you know I, i'm in <laughs> <laughs> get something burning. yeah no we'll have to we'll have to do a round two the only other thing that i that i kind of wanted to get to and and i don't know how much of a discussion it is is, is talking a little bit about like the daily schedule of of the the champions i know that was one of the things that you mentioned is something interesting to, to chat about as well is is how they organize their daily schedules but 
I'm going to put that back to you. Do you think that's a discussion for a different day or do you think, you know, what do yeah, you think? That, there? Yeah, that, that's a discussion for another day. I mean, we could talk about, mm -hmm. you know, what do you do between six and 8 a.m. for a week? <laughs> so I, I think again, to, to pay all due respects to that, it's probably better for a, a second nice. conversation, you know, to do Sounds that. Good. Let's do that then. Yeah. There's yeah. a light, a lot to chew on uh, by yeah. <laughs> from this one here. So, um, what are, so before you win.com is definitely everyone should go there and we'll link yeah. it up in the show notes. Um, what's a, what's a book or something that you find yourself referencing often or recommending to your clients and, and folks that you really admire? As, as far as a book? A, a book or something that you just come off, you know, like you, you, you tend to go back to all the time because it's so dang good. I recommend it. You know, I, I feel like I'm a broken record. I don't know if you remember what records were, but <laughs> no. things turned around, you know, you scratch them, right? You go, wiki, wiki. <laughs> yeah. You remember those things? What is that? Thing? <laughs> That's what DJs use. <laughs> My daughter yes. said, what is that? <laughs> She's a little younger um, than us. <laughs> yeah. Just, just a couple things that I, I'd like to say that I think are probably better said and remembered um, than anything. Uh, yeah, to me, um, this goes back to my daughter who we adopted. Um, she came from the worst uh, environment you could imagine. She was in Colombia. Mm. She was 10 at the time and uh, she was exposed to human cruelty that I could not, I, to even think about it, uh, gives me the chills. Mm. And uh, the thing that I would say is that had people shown up differently for her, uh, she wouldn't have this burden that she didn't ask for to deal with. To what extent it can be transcended is still a question mark. But to say that uh, every moment of our lives, uh, we have a chance to create impact. The guy that showed up wearing the Olympic t-shirt called me to the Olympics. He probably doesn't even remember it. Mm -hmm. You know, to him, it was uh, just another day. Mm -hmm. But it changed my life trajectory forever. And Everything that we say, everything that we do, how we show up does speak to people either visually or through the spoken word that will say something to them. And I, with all my heart and conviction, uh, know that for me personally, that um, I'm honor bound to produce my best work, uh, to honor the privilege of a pass through this dimension on this planet. And that's part of how I honor it. And when I perform and come from my best, it uh, also says thank you to my friends and my family, my coaches, my mentors, my corner men, uh, my peers, my friends that were like always there that gave selflessly to them. And when I do something that's of significance, uh, it's on their shoulders and mm -hmm. they deserve to, to share in that. And I want them to know that. And perhaps the most important reason why living a life of extraordinary excellence is important is because it shows other people what's possible. You look at this world right now, it's gone insane. Mm -hmm. It's gone insane. You know, where everything that makes us distinct has been like stripped away. Mm -hmm. You know, there's 7 billion people on this planet right now that's all capable of doing something unique and distinct to contribute to the human um, experience. Just imagine a life yeah. like that where we, we're doing our best work to honor our talents and our uh, presence of being in, in others and supporting others to, to do the same. It would be a completely different uh, world context that we have, that we would have rather than, than what we're experiencing at, at this moment in time. Hmm. And I would say that the most important decision anybody can make every day before they start engaging people is to decide how you're going to show up. Again, never underestimate the value of a word spoken. Uh, your presence of being and the things that you say to others that you don't even know who's watching that could change their lives forever. So that's hmm. the thing that I always think about that's first and foremost of highest significance. It's good for everybody. It's also good for me. You know, I don't yeah. want my humanness to be the place I come from. I want to be superhuman, hmm. not for my own sake to showcase me because that doesn't mean anything to me, but to be a, a beacon for others, to see a possibility of what one can be and how they can live and the rewards of taking a particular path. And to me, uh, thanks again for the opportunity to be able to share that uh, with the team. That was amazing. That yeah. was beautiful. Thank Powerful you. message. Yeah. And I think, uh, I think that's a perfect place to, to go ahead and uh, 
wrap this one up. And you know, thanks so much for spending the time with us today, Jeff. I really appreciate thanks it. Thanks again. Uh, Joe thanks, and uh, Matt, thanks, thanks again for everything. See you next, next time. time. Bye.